would like to talk about the three, three streams of the gospel as I see it. You know, I just wrote this book on angels and I talk about the angels that function in that three streams, you know, the three archangels. And that, that's real key because the angels follow what Jesus taught us, you know. But there's the good news. Uh, Jesus said, you know, he came to proclaim the good news, not good advice, good news. And then there's healing, which God is bringing back to the church. And then there's uh, the battle with evil, deliverance. Jesus knew he had an enemy. He kept his eye on him the whole time. And I tell people, you know, make sure you know about your enemy because he's against you. If you don't know about your enemy, you're in trouble. Learn about him, you know. And Paul admonishes us over and over, put on the full armor of God and all this. And Jesus himself calls Satan a roaring lion going around seeking whom he may devour. And he's the father of lies. And Jesus talked about the enemy. He talked about him and he dealt with him. I love it that uh, I remember when I was writing the book recently, I used that story you know, where Jesus walked into the synagogue and the man there that was possessed by evil spirits uh, was thrown to the floor, cried out and said, Jesus, son of God, most holy one of God, what do you want with us? Have you come to destroy us? And I say, yes, <laughs> yes. But the very presence of Jesus coming in, this man went through a deliverance without even a direct confrontation unlike some of the other stories of deliverance, like with the pigs and the man outside the village. But we have to get back to the complete message of the gospel, to the power of God coming into our lives. I think it's interesting that in our churches, if you compare it to that experience in the synagogue, I've yet to be in a church, uh, say, before I got involved in this ministry, where anyone had anything manifest now that says to me, the power of God is not as present in that church service, you know? And, and how can he be? Because, you know, we've so limited and contained and, and scripted, you know, the Holy Spirit or the work of the Holy Spirit. We never even give him time to work. We don't give him time to work. You know, we say these quick prayers. And so if we move into a post-Christian era, in America like Europe is in, then we're going to have to face what Europe is facing right now. The fastest growing religion in Europe today is Satanism. It's the fastest growing religion. We're not far behind that here because of all the evil, you know, Wiccan and all the other things that are being ushered in. And I've watched this for years. If you had the, you know, bell curve, it's way, it's moved way up. So it's, it's that old sticking your head in the sand and ignoring this tremendous evil power out there that is out to destroy us. And our young people are being especially influenced now. And the, the enemy is not dealt with with simple prayers. He's not dealt with without the power of the Holy Spirit. We really have to know the enemy. We have to know how to pray against him. We teach at Christian Healing Ministries uh, prayers of protection that you need to pray every morning. Not in a neurotic way, but just pray for that protection over yourself, over your children, your grandchildren, your community, uh, your church. Pray for God's holy angels to come and battle on our behalf, like Michael, who's in charge of spiritual warfare. My husband wrote this book, Deliverance from Evil. And it's being used in seminaries and, and different places around the world. We get letters all the time from people that said, you know, I read that book. I realized I had that problem in my own life. I got someone to pray with me and I've been set free. And it's a sad statement on the church that people have to fly to Christian healing ministries from various points in the world because they're, they're tormented or afflicted by evil. Now that's sad. They have to get on a plane pay thousands of dollars. We don't charge them for the prayer. But to get there, if the church was doing what the church should be doing, those people could stay in their local community, have people minister to them, and deal with the evil that's in their lives. There is a thought that is pervasive that if you're a Christian, you can't have a demon. That is absolutely untrue. I've spent 40 years in this ministry. I didn't go looking for demons. 
I am a psychologist and I love people and I wanted to help people. In my private practice, I would say at least one out of five of my clients needed deliverance. And I had to learn how to help them. I had to either that or send them to a priest or a minister, but you couldn't find a priest or a minister that would pray with them. You know, so I really, uh, when I was in Jerusalem, a man from Pretoria, South Africa, came to our community and Dr. Lindsay uh, got him to stay like six months. His name was Ralph Van Coy, and he taught us about the deliverance ministry because we were praying for people for healing and the power of God was coming and some people started manifesting and we didn't know what to do about it. And he knew, he'd been taught in a village in the midst of Africa about the whole witchcraft and demonic and Christians, the way I understand this, you know, Derek Prince, I think was so fabulous at teaching on this. He said that if you think of what's within us as like a, a town, think about that for a moment. Uh, when we invite God in, he comes on Main Street, then he moves over to Maple and then he's on Elm and you know, kind of America, USA. But there's still this area that we don't allow him in. You know, it's, it's kind of the place where the rats are and all this, you know, the poor, not, not poor people, but uh, people without God. I think of that sometimes. It's like there's a section of us, and as a psychologist, I really see this, you know, that there's parts of us that we never bring to God. It's not that we're dissociating, but there's those parts that are hidden. And I believe that's where the enemy has an opportunity to be in those places. And so as we continue to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us, he moves into those places and that's when the enemy has to be dealt with. There's an awful lot of Christians, uh, it's tragic really, that are suicidal, that are suffering from clinical depression, they're physically sick, um, they're just miserable and they don't even know why. And it takes that gift of discernment to really know what's there that's in Corinthians and more people need to grow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be able to know when someone walks up to you and they're asking for prayer, you can see that. You can just see it's there and then use the power of God to, to get rid of it. It's a wonderful. I would love for people, instead of thinking of deliverance from evil, it's, it's just another, another facet of healing. It really is just another facet of healing. Jesus dealt with evil, the early church dealt with evil, and we deal with it, but we've not done it well. Well, the church is ill-equipped to deal with it because it's not been dealt with <laughs> since the Middle Ages, probably, or, so, or earlier. Uh, training has to happen, training has to happen. Uh, and this is one area uh, where the least amount of training exists throughout the world. And some of it that is out there is not balanced. You know, some people, we say, see a demon behind every cornflake. You know, it's like everything's caused by the enemy. You know, we still have free will. We still have brokenness. We have areas, you know, bad behavior comes out of, you know, bad experiences is what I always say. But to really be able to deal with the enemy, we have to, we have to be trained. This is one area where training has to take place. How wonderful if it could be in seminaries. Francis said when he went through seminary, he had eight years of theological training in, in seminary. He was a Dominican. And he said they had like a half a minute on it in eight years. I saw this with the missionaries I worked with in Jerusalem. Many of those good fine people were taken out by the enemy because they didn't know how to protect themselves. They got involved in things that were really evil and they didn't know how to get out. So training is the key, good, credible training, and it's got to come back in the seminaries. It really does. It needs to be balanced. These three streams are the ones that we constantly come back to, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit and then the, the three streams of Jesus. The Lord, yes, it was, I had a conference last week for women, and we just had such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was so phenomenal, the healings and transformations, repentance, all that. But the Lord... In my prayer time, he asked me right before I went, he said, I think this is the question for the church. Do you believe me or not? 
do you believe what I said in the Bible? Did, that is, do you, I know people that would die for the Bible. I mean, I know they, they would be scalded alive to protect the Bible, but yet they don't believe everything that's in it because it's not been taught to them. It's not been part of their heritage. So do we believe, do we believe the words of Jesus? Do we believe you have an enemy? Do we believe pray your prayers of protection? Do we believe he cast out evil? Or was that just some kind of psychosomatic babble that was going on? You know, and I've heard leaders reduce the demonic to something that, oh, they were superstitious and that's what they believed. I've worked in psychiatric hospitals. I know what the enemy looks like in a person. I know what mental illness looks like, and there's a difference. You know, and I've worked with Christian leaders that have gotten into some real evil, and they don't know where to go. They have nowhere to turn to get out of it. So the evil one is real. Demons are real. The Bible says a third of the angelic realm fell with Lucifer, who's now Satan. They're out there. They're out there, and we need to know about them. Well, I recently wrote a book about angels. I started, uh, this was way back, like 30 years ago. I was getting ready to teach in a conference up in Algonquin, Maine. And I always go before God and I always say, what do you want me to teach? Because, you know, there's so many things you can d teach. And he said, I want you to teach on angels. And I said, well, I don't know anything about angels. <laughs> I'd be happy to do it. And he said, well, I do. And at that time, there was one book out. It was Billy Graham's. That was it. And, of course, I didn't have it. I was in Maine. But I went to the Bible and I started and I realized angels are mentioned more than 300 times. They're from Genesis to Revelation. They're very active and they're incredible. And so anyway, 15 years ago, he asked me if I would write a book about it and I just couldn't do it. I didn't have time. We were traveling and I had two small children and a ministry. So finally, this last year, I, I knew that I had to do that. It's one of those when God tells you to do it. Eventually, you have to do it. So I sat down and wrote it. And I wrote it because he asked me to. But I wrote it to encourage people. Because, you know, if we talk about evil, we want to always balance that out and talk about all the good in God's kingdom. And these wonderful beings that just are so much in the nature and likeness of God in terms of their love and their presence and their aid to Christians, uh, we tend to neglect them except at Christmas. You know, we have a little fat little cherubs we hang on our Christmas trees and send each other angel cards. And of course, then the new age just took over angels. I mean, there's angels, fairies, all that. <laughs> and I thought, that's all I need is, you know, to write a book on angels and everybody think, well, you know, she's really gone over the edge. Now she believes in angels. But uh, I do, I do believe in angels and I cherish them in terms of God's kingdom. But I wrote the book to encourage Christians, to let them know, as the Bible says, that we do have angels with us. Uh, Hebrews says that they're ministering spirits sent to serve those that will inherit salvation. I believe that every person has a guardian angel. I believe people in ministry have lots of angels with them. I've had people tell me that for years. They see angels all around us and other leaders. You know, they're protecting us and they're helping us. Uh, so I wrote the book. It's done very well. It's, it's a crossover book because a lot of non-Christians buy it. And I've got healing in the book. I've got deliverance. I've got all kinds of stuff in the book. It's not just angels. But it's their role in kingdom work. When I wrote the book, I, I thought, well, maybe not when I wrote the book, but at least 10 years ago, I thought an angel is an angel. And when I started really studying in scripture and then going to the, the history of the church, what's been written over the centuries, I found out there's all kinds of angels, you know, archangels, seraphim, cherubim, angels, guardian angels. There's, so I talk about the different types of angels and what they do here on this earth and what they do in the heavenlies. And it's uh, been tremendous. Uh, feedback from people. I've done a lot of t uh, television, radio, and people just say, you know, this has been just so encouraging in my life, and I believe now that God sends angels to help me or to help my children or my church. You know, and of course you can't get through Revelation without an angel on every page, and they're very active, very active in the world. 
and in our individual lives and in churches. So it's, uh, it's another area we've neglected. Angels are for real is the name of the book. And uh, they are real and they're wonderful. What people don't think about with angels, and this is something I've had feedback on, is angels uh, are pure love. I mean, they're pure love. They don't have the fallen nature we have. And they love us. And I've never had anybody say that to me, that they actually love us and they, they're on our side. They wanna help us, um, not only in ministry, but in their individual lives. They're very loving. They carry the presence of God with them. It's kind of like someone who's been in prayer for a few hours. They kind of glow and they, they, they've got this presence about them when they come out of their prayer chair or whatever. Uh, that's the way angels are. They just show up and the whole atmosphere changes when they enter the room.